All right, so this talks about backdooring Win32 PE files because I haven't figured out how to do 64 yet. My name is Josh. That's my Twitter. I'm a former Marine. Uh, I do pen testing, operational security. I like long walks on the beach. Uh, those are my certs in big Indian order as far as difficulty. And uh, those are some of the language I, uh, I dabble in. So, a <clears throat> little, little background information. Uh, this is the portable executable format. Um, it's pretty much been that way for a long time. Uh, it, it's, it has to be backwards compatible, so Windows 8 uses the same format. <clears throat> it, it's, if you ever really get into it, 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 it's really unusual how it's been set up. It, it's, it feels like, like I say there, spaghetti. And it's uh, easy to manipulate if you know what you're doing. And that link that you can't see, that's the uh, link to the current, uh, I guess, reference for the PE format. Now next is the uh, common object file format. Uh, that is right after the PE um, th the PE header. This is this is like the most important section. This is where all the reverse engineering information that you want. This is the data, text, and uh, every single section has a different uh, access that the computer is supposed to um, respect. But um, we'll go on. That we we'll probably won't talk about that today. So. The PE format can be easily uh, patched. Uh, Microsoft does it. Uh, software crackers do it. Key geners do it. Metasploit does it. Um, and pen testers should too. You're going to need a little bit of uh, ASM knowledge and some basic debugging. So this is how I learned how to uh, patch an executable. Um, it was done by hand. And there's a link there uh, in the slides. I'm going to put this on my uh, bit bucket. But um, so you basically you put a jump instruction to your appended code section. So you actually write to the executable, and then you jump back, continue execution. So what happens is your binary continues execution, um, so the user really doesn't know what's going on. <coughs> Who here is taking the CTP, cracking the perimeter? So it's like two people. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> so you can also do this. You can pick a code cave in your code and you can jump around. Um, so as security professionals, why would we want to patch or backdoor executables and DLLs? And this works on DLLs too. Um, not all of them, but some of them. So for social engineering pen testing, you want to salt a parking lot with USBs. Uh, you want to uh, patch some executables on a red team box. You know, if you're doing red teaming, like uh, some of the war games that are going on this time of year. Uh, if you want to do any prototyping for your shell code, instead of putting in a C uh, file just to see how it reacts to AV, you can actually put it in a file you're going to be using it with and um, see how the antivirus reacts to it. And from my experience, McAfee and Semantic really don't care. Um, so, and also you can do some proactive protection if you have vendors that have a back door into your environment for whatever reason you could put you could patch it with a pop-up box so that they try to execute it when you're not around someone actually has to be there to hit okay <coughs> so and maybe it's fun I, I, I kind of enjoy it and uh, I don't know about it being any profit in it really so <clears throat> the goal is to uh, persist hide in plain sight so you want you want the executable to function normally as possible um, and you want to, to backdoor a program that the user uses a lot or will want to use over and over. And you want it, of course, to avoid antivirus. And you, you, you want to get a, um, a program that is a service or a uh, like sys internal tools where you have to run as an admin. So w the easiest way to do this is to write a script so it's automated and so that you can also uh, customize some of the format. Now, when I used to do this by hand, the fastest I could do it was in 10 minutes. And that was, you know, uh, an executable that did not have any import tables. Um, it, it, because once you have an import table, you have to change around the PE header. And it gets kind of complicated because you're doing hex, you're doing 
your, your math and hex. And um, so this is the solution. Uh, use the back door. So I wrote a script called the Backdoor Factory. Uh, it will. <laughs> there are no no goatee jokes. <laughs> All right. So um, so it's a way to insert a backdoor into most uh, Win32 executables and DLLs. There are actually executables that have protections against this. Surprisingly, TeamViewer actually has a protection against this built into it because I wanted to use it as a demo, and I couldn't. Uh, because they have like a round robin, they have DLLs looking at each other, and they also have reg I think they have registry keys. I, I really didn't have time to dig into it, but they will alert you when they, you know it's actually been backdoored. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I try to make sure that the executable and the DLL uh, continue execution. I um, wrote the script in Python, and it uses all standard Python libraries, so you don't have to go out and get PE file. Um, and this is a different method than uh, Metasploit, M MFS, MSF encode T. So T is the template. And what happens is uh, when you use a template, it's, uh, it overwrites the first instructions of entry into memory. And uh, when you do that, it's a one time. And the user might, if it's a smart user, the user is going to be like, well, that's not good. And they may, if they're really smart, they'll unplug their computer immediately. Uh, but if they're not, then you know, they'll just click it 17 times. Um, so how does it work? I uh, mapped the entire PE header. I started to use PE file, but it was too complicated for what I was going with, so I just used uh, about 40 lines of Python. Um, it determines if it supports the executor DLL, because right now I only support um, Win32, and I don't do, th this script will not do UPX, because you have to rebuild the import tables if you uh, use e UPX, and uh, that's a little complicated. Um, so it ga gathers information about the shellcode, um, and it will allow you to continue execution if the shellcode you use um, has that built into it. So the shell codes that I have in the tool is a uh, reverse uh, TCP. There's a message pop up and there's a bind, and these allow continued execution. Um, so you can also append a code cave, or you can find a code cave. So it patches the binaries directly. This is not um, in memory. So you patch a binary, it's patched. Um, and also, it encodes shell code if the encoder scheme is built into the tool. I, I, use, I built in a simple XOR scheme. It's, um, it really doesn't do anything for antiviruses. Any good antivirus is going to see right through that. So it's just more of an example. So this is um, a PE file. I think this is TCP view because it says TCP view. Um, <coughs> so this is before runtime. So you have a call. And this is after runtime. So you have a jump. This is jumping to the code cave. So this is the code cave before. This is the code cave after. <clears throat> so, so. We have a question. When you're referring to code cave, you're just referring to spots in memory where it's just, where it's spots in the binary, where it's just like. Zeros. Okay. Yeah. What's nice about a code cave is that the binary doesn't change size. So, uh, if you append a code cave, you're going to be appending, depending on your shell code, you're going to add about two to 400 bytes of buffer space that I put in there in case there are certificates. Um, that bleed over into it at, at runtime. Uh, <clears throat> so, if you append a code cave, you're going to add about 600 bytes to the um, to the executable. So, so you can do an entire directory. In one of the demonstrations here, I, I backdoor all of uh, sys internals in a matter of seconds. Um, so you can do host and port selection on the fly. There's that simple XOR encoder for demonstration. And also, I wrote an injector model or a module that you run this, you compile it using Pi Installer. You can run it on a Windows machine and it will go through and find and inject executables for you. Um, and also I include some randomization for the shellcode. I include uh, five different types of NOPs to be used and also um, ones complement. If you know what ones complement is, it's two numbers, four bytes each, that add up to zero. Or actually and to zero. So those are randomized also every time shellcode's been uh, produced. So all right, let's get to a demo. Let's see. I don't like uh, how the Mac 
This is my first presentation ever, so it's kind of odd. All right. So we are going to get um, all the back doors for P I mean, not all the back doors, all the code keys for PS exec. So these are all the code caves that are over 380 bytes. Yeah, the beginning of the cave. So that cave in the beginning there, that's part of the PE header. You don't want to backdoor that. It's a bad idea. It won't continue execution. So then you have your data sections. You can see the size of the cave. That's in decimal. Um, so that's that demonstration. Also, you can use an L flag to uh, say, let's say you have a really small egg hunter you want to use. You can just say, um, like, small would be 32, but let's say 100 byte. So then it will give you all the caves, 100 uh, decimal, you know, in length or above. All right, so the next part of the demo is backdoor via appending a code cave. Let me um, start up my VM. Any questions? Well, this is. Did you, uh, yeah. Did you use um, C types to um, do some of the lower level like memory mapping stuff with Python in terms of uh, finding the code caves? <coughs> no, I just did a simple look for zero. If you see zero, start counter. Continue until you don't see zero. Uh, sometimes, yes, and that actually, now not my code, but sometimes, the, so code caves are part of what a compiler does, and so it could be either either from the programmer specifically, or it could be from, um, oh God, sorry, I'm trying to talk and think at the same time. Um, so. Code caves exist because the compiler or the programmer did it on purpose. Uh, some caves exist because they have to. So if you actually put your code in a cave, you will not be able to continue execution. And I can demonstrate that. All right. All right, some time today. I apologize. Any other any other questions? Yes. Um, so, how does how do you get a user to to use your patch? Like, is that so you patch? That's a good question. So you patch the executable <coughs> first, and then you either deliver it to the user. So this is the reason. This is this is an example why you check MD5 sums on executables. All right. All right. So the first example is appending a code cave. Um, now we're going to do, uh, so we're going to pick a shell. Port 80 and my host machine. And also the A flag does the append. And it's done. That's not friendly. All right. So on this other tab, I have Metasploit listening as a, um, as Damien. All right. So I'm going to invoke just a command shell. There you go. Works normally. All right, so the next example that I have for you is, um, so find a code cave. So 
So if you take off the A uh, flag, it will just find a code cave. So we're given a, a couple caves here that we can pick from. Um, I know that number eight doesn't work because I've done this so much. So I will use number seven, lucky number seven. Oh. And by the way, McAfee's running on this. Yeah. So what happened when you used the uh, number eight? When oh, I'll, I'll go over that if we have time. Okay. So more output. Um, it worked again. So <clears throat> the next uh, demonstration is. So we're gonna backdoor an entire directory of executables. Now I downloaded sys internals, and I have it in a uh, test. So uh, there you go. There's a 64-bit executable in here, and you'll see what happens whenever I whenever it encounters a 64-bit executable. So for this, I can just leave the settings the same, and I just use the D flag and the directory. So test, and then you, you want to continue, of course. Oops, my bad. So I sh you have to use the A flag if you want this to be extremely fast, or for each executable, it'll ask you which cave do you want it to be in. So, and the entire directory has been backdoored. Uh, now this is you can tell this is 64-bit uh, because down here at the bottom it says this program does not support this format. So it, I actually checked to see you know what format it is. It can recognize MIPS or whatever. Whatever the PE executable can, can recognize, this will recognize it. And it only, we only do Intel x86 right now. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and open this up. That's running. All right. So what's nice about um, be able to do this on sys internal tools. So if you're you're doing a red team and you find their sys internal directory, you could just back, you know, you could just uh, kind of just stash all these there and so let's open them all up. Oh uh, well, that didn't work out. Um, so you can so I'm getting output all these work They all work. They all have back doors in them. So, let me. <clears throat> so the next module is. Let me. I got to re revert this real quick. <coughs> I have a couple of demos. All right, so this is going to be demoing the um, the in the injector module. All right. Oh, shadow windows. All right. 
right. Again, my apologies. This went much faster at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, no, I didn't doze off. Uh. All right. Okay. So the injector module will, um, as you'll see, will stop processes, inject shellcode into them, and attempt to restart them. Um, Uh, there is a target list in the shellcode, uh, or not in the shellcode, but in the in the Python uh, script. <coughs> so this is going out and finding. Uh, this, the executables in the script. So we're doing Process Explorer, PS Exec, TCP View, Hamachi, VNC Server, VN, VM Tools, um, and then Tor. So all these are running. We'll just let it run. Any questions or anything? So it killed Process Explorer. It killed VM Tools. Restarted Process Explorer. And you see sessions are popping up. Hmm. So VNC servers restarting. And Tor Browser's been uh, backdoored, or the, the start of Tor Browser. So every time you restart this machine, three processors are going to start up. Uh, VM Tools, uh, Hamachi, and VNC Server. And those will serve a, uh, a system shell out to um, the, the C2. Any questions on that? Anything? Yeah, yeah, you, there, there's a, there's a, um, yeah, yeah, you, there's also a, VM tools. so right here is where um, <coughs> these are, these are, if you're not familiar, okay, so if you're not familiar with Python, that's a Python dict, <coughs> dictionary, um, <coughs> and so you can set the dependencies, so you have the executable, the dependencies, the service, and if you want to, if it's, you want to restart it uh, if it's running. So there you go. Um, also, there's a slash capital D, and if you do that, it will delete the original file. So right now, what it does, it renames the old, the the, the original file to file.exe.old. So if you were to slay, say say uh, dash capital D, it would delete all the original files. So it doesn't look like anything uh, was actually there. <coughs> So, um, do I have, do I still have time? I guess I do. All right. Yes. All right. So, <coughs> so the next demo was going to be um, Trend Micro, uh, uh, AV, and the, the thing with Trend Micro, it's it's pretty much the same thing. It's a Windows Seven machine, and Trend Micro, what what it does. I think it looks at uh, signatures and also certificates. And if you change the actual executable, it'll flag it. 
as far as the size of the executable. But if you um, <laughs> if you put your code in a cave, it doesn't care. It'll, it'll be like, all right, you can do whatever you want. It so it doesn't do application whitelisting. Um, but I guess some people wanted to, to see about Windows 8. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that one. Yeah, man. Yep. I did that for the uh, CTP. Yeah. I totally overdid that. I so when I saw the answers I was like for CTP for the I was using uh, interpreter into Netcat and everybody was like, Okay, start your handle or start your um, Netcat listener again. I'm like still going. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're one of those. I used uh I used Ollie and found a function that I could uh, hijack, and I just kept killing the application, you know, over and over. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So we're going to take an executable from before and just drop it in, uh, and it's going to get flagged because, actually, I'm really impressed with Microsoft Security Central's. It's malware. Yes, it is. Um, so we're going to change it. Very briefly. So, so this is the shell code. This is um, what I'm using for this this demonstration right here. So, different AVs do things differently. Microsoft Security Essentials looks at bytes. It actually looks at bytes and patterns of bytes. Um, and I, I was actually kind of impressed with that. So, what I have done is I went ahead and changed some shell code here. So, this is like this is the original. All right. See how it's all in line, and this is the the Microsoft AV free um, shellcode. And so, what what is interesting is that it only took five bytes, well placed bytes. And I did what they like an artillery uh, 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 kind of kind of um, thing where you you know you kind of like work your way in. So what I did is I put all knobs into the uh, code cave didn't hit. So then I put this back in and I would go through line by line and figure out what line actually triggered the AV. And then once I figured out it was three lines, then I went byte by byte and figured out what byte triggered the AV in each line or what separation of bytes. And so I added a knob here, uh, three knobs here, and then a knob here. So it doesn't like FFD5. And so if you put separation between FFD5, if you put a knob in front of it, Microsoft Security Essentials is not looking for that. So five bytes does Microsoft have. Yep. So let's uh, do PS exec again. We'll change the uh, shell code to AV test. So if you mess it up, it will actually remind you. Again, I'm going to do uh, section 7. There you go. So we beat Microsoft Security Essentials. And it literally took me about 15 minutes to figure that out. Um, 
So that you can use this as a way to bypass AV or figure out shell code that will bypass AV if you're on a pen test. So I, at least that's that's how I use it. So uh, any any questions? So uh, are, you, are you publishing all this, or have you? Already oh, it's already out there. Yeah, uh, I put it out a couple days ago. It got no interest whatsoever, because um, no one knows me. <laughs> uh, so all right, so some mitigations. Like I said, UPX is very difficult to backdoor. It is it, it, because you have to unpack it. They, they have some GUI tools for it, but I don't like using GUI because you, it's hard to automate a GUI. Um, so if you did some file integ integrity checks, like, uh, like I said, TeamViewer actually does a really good job. Microsoft Office does a good job. But there is one DLL that you can backdoor, and it will get a number of applications in Microsoft Office. It's kind of funny. Um, so application whitelisting, so if you're using trusted, uh, not, not, not TAF, that's uh, terrible. Uh, if you're using, um, what's the uh, trust, no, no, Bit9 or any of those other application whitelisting uh, app, you know, tools, you'll, you'll catch this. So also run what you know and protect your computer, like uh, check your hashes. And if you find this, if you find that something like this ran on your computer, you know, wipe the drive. So. Uh, in the future, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, just wipe the drive. Shoot the computer. Not always, but that's my option. Um, so, in the future, I want to do x64 support. I, I'm some of these executables will not run if they have a if they start with a call. Sometimes they will fail because of a ASLR. Yeah, ASLR um, because uh, the the random randomization of the entry instructions. Uh, so I'm writing some shell code that will actually I'm I have written shell code that will actually figure out what the offset is. I'm trying to figure out how to get it back into execution. So um, so I'm thinking about Im implementing multiple cave jumping. So if you have multiple caves, you can split the shell code into different caves. I'm thinking about doing um, maybe will this work on ELF or uh, MACO formats? I would think so. I have, I don't know. Uh, also, import table patching. Let's say you have a interpreter DLL that's special that you like. Maybe you could act, we could figure out a way to actually patch the import table. <coughs> Shouldn't be too hard. And also um, for the injector module, I want to do um, so. If you know a good cave for like let's say PX, PS exec. Eight will not work, but seven does. I'm thinking about having in that dictionary for for the injector module, putting like a cave number, so it will automatically figure out which cave it wants to go into. So um, that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Is it Windows 8 trying to do ASL, ASLR for all executables now? Um, from my understanding, Windows 7 does it. Okay. Because because. I discovered the problem this morning okay. on one of the executables. <laughs> uh, so, but it's not really, it's not hard to bypass. It's just you have to write your shell code so it can find out where it is and then um, so it can figure out the offset. Okay. So. Have you run this against PC tools? PC tools? I've, I've never heard of PC tools. No. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? All right. There's my. There's the uh, big bucket where it's at. It's up. Uh, and also there's my Twitter handle. So, thank you very much. Thanks for having us.